thank you so much for being with us. We're so happy that you could be joining us today. We know there's a busy three-day weekend ahead of us. And so you spending your lunch hour with us means a lot. We're going to get started right off the gate, engaging with all of you. Um, we're going to start off with a poll today, and it's going to be at the bottom middle of your screen. You can see the icon for polls. Click on that, and then we want you to answer a question for us. We want you to kind of have control of this Friday's um, huddle. So what native trout species are you most interested in learning about today? We know that there's a lot of species, and we want you to control which ones that we kind of focus a little bit more on. So go ahead and do that again. It's um, the polls icon at the uh, center bottom of your screen. Click on that and answer that poll for us. Um, and the poll is going to be going on um, throughout my little intro here, and then we'll let you know which of the top two species that you guys picked are we're going to talk about in detail. But don't worry, we're going to send you info. We're going to give you this whole uh, PowerPoint presentation in an email, and you're going to have info on all the species, but the top two from our poll are what we're going to focus on today. So while you're voting, I'll introduce myself. My name is Tish Pomadesi. I'm a marketing specialist with CDFW, and I'm part of a team that works to recruit, retain, and reactivate Californians to hunting, fishing, foraging, and shooting sports. Recruit, retain, reactivate. We call ourselves R3. So these Harvest Huddle Hours are a virtual program that we use to connect with people all over the state and just really offer resources to build up your confidence and get you more comfortable with hunting, fishing, foraging, shooting sports, and really just getting outdoors and appreciating our state's natural resources, wildlife, and habitats. So the whole purpose is to really engage with you, adult audiences that are just starting out or returning their journey to their sport and getting outdoors. So speaking of engaging, if you are logging in a little bit late, we know we got a little late start, but we do have a few more minutes to participate in the poll that we're doing today. It's at the bottom center of your screen, click on polls and answer the question about which native trout species you are most interested in talking about today. Let us know which species you're excited about in the top two will be discussed live and then we'll send info on others, all the other species in a follow-up email later this afternoon. So getting right into our panelists, today we have two very informative and knowledgeable experts that will talk about the basics of cold freshwater trout fishing. Something to know, all of our R3H3 sessions are recorded, so if you hear something you like and you want to share it with someone in your circle, this episode will be available on the department's R3 webpage within a few days. That webpage is wildlife.ca.gov forward slash R3. We'll pop that um, address for you in the chat. And okay, before we get started, some real quick housekeeping. We know a lot of you are familiar with all these different uh, webinar platforms, but if you're new to the Zoom platform, you can change the way your screen looks by clicking the top right icons. There are two views, gallery and presenter. Feel free to play around with the platform as much as you want. Anything you do won't affect anyone else. So you do you and just set up your screen any way you want. At the end of this session, we are going to offer um, more opportunities for audience participation with Q&A, and that's going to take place with the Q&A feature. It, too, is at the bottom, sort of middle of the screen. It looks like two little conversation bubbles. You click on that and then type in your question, and then our moderators will do everything they can to get you answers right away. As I mentioned, this session is recorded and will be on our website in the coming days. The website for that, again, is wildlife.ca.gov forward slash R3. And again, that is in the chat for you. You can find all of our past R3H3 recordings there under the California Wild Kitchen tab. Now let's introduce our team. So on Q&A, answering your questions and fielding them to the presenters, we have CDFW R3 coordinator, Jen Benedict, and marketing specialist, Robert Karam from the R3 team out of the Office of Communication, Education, and Outreach. So big thank you to them for helping us today. Now we do our best to answer everyone during the event, but if for some reason your question doesn't get answered or it's a little bit outside of the scope of today's presentation, just email us and we'll get right back to you. The email to email us is r 3 statewideprogram at wildlife.ca.gov. That'll be in the chat for you as well. Now for our awesome presenters that we have with us today, Leslie Albert it has been working with CDFW in fisheries for the past seven years and has been working in wildlife and conservation for more than 15. She currently works for the North Central Region Heritage and Wild Trout Program, focusing on native trout conservation and angling opportunities. Leslie loves spending time outdoors in any capacity, but particularly enjoys spending time in the Sierra Nevadas. Now, John Hansen has worked for the Department of Fish and Wildlife for 25 years, 
all of that time, at least during the summer, conducting field work related to California's trout. His work area, like Leslie, is the north central region, which includes Plumas County in the north, south to Alpine and Calaveras counties, and west to Glen and Calusa. He has spent many summers fishing for trout in this region and has landed all the California native trout except a few. So with that, welcome Leslie and John, and our poll on which native trout you wanted to hear about, that is now closed, and we're going to hear which ones were the top two that we're going to focus on today from Leslie in a little bit. She'll announce the top two, and then again, we'll send you information on all of the other species. But with that, John and Leslie, welcome, and take it away. My name is John Hansen, and like Tisha said, I've uh, worked for the department for 25 years, and I have caught all, actually all the trout we have, all the all with the Warner Lakes Basin um, Red Band, and but I've caught all the others, including Browns and the Brooks. Um, so maybe just go to the next slide, Leslie. So this is a beginner's guide to trout fishing. Um, this is a gentleman fishing on uh, Green Creek, which is down in Inyo County, I believe. Um, it's uh, right at the Green Creek campground. And you can see it's a fairly small stream. Um, he's using a spinning rod um, and he's just flicking the bait into the creek, which is kind of in the black part of the, you know, behind the spinning rod, black area there. And he's just flicking the, uh, uh, the bait, probably using a, a, a salmon eggs and just uh, letting it drift down to where the fish want to take it. So the spinning rod, next slide, Leslie. The spinning rod is probably one of the most versatile rods you can have. It can fish in small streams if you saw before there, on the side before, um, to large reservoirs. Um, you can even do multi-species other than um, trout too. I mean, it, it, can, it can fish for everything in the state of probably ocean fish. Um, like I say, they're very versatile. These two rods are kind of moderately priced rods and you'd have to buy the reel separate from the rod itself. I think they're probably medium action, um, but you can buy a light action um, rod, which has a little more flexibility, uh, bounces around more, or, you know, bends more. Uh, but you can look at the on the base of the right, kind of above the real areas. They'll have it, what kind of uh, medium rod, a medium action, or a light action, or bigger, uh, bigger than that. Um, basically, the bigger the rod, the you know, the, it can handle bigger the fish. Also on the base of the rod, it'll tell you the uh, uh, weights of the uh, lures you can use, you know, from maybe a quarter ounce to a half ounce. So kind of all the information is about the rod is on it itself. Um, the reels will also have um, the weight of the, the three pound test, um, the test of the uh, line, um, like three pound test, five pound test. So the higher the number, the bigger the fish you can catch. And it also gave you how many yards um, of that you can put on uh, the reel. Um, if you're going for your first time out, I would probably go buy a combo set of uh, a spinning rod. So you'll cut, you'll get the rod, the reel, and probably even line on it, all for probably more, less than what you uh, uh, the rod that you see here on it, um, and and you're just ready to go. Uh, so what? Do you use, what do you put on that thing? Um, this is kind of a tackle box that I purchased at a box store. It, uh, it basically had everything but the bait, that, uh, the bait and the lures that are on kind of the lid. Um, but it came with everything you could probably need to fish for trout for a day. Um, let's see if this works. You know, here are some of the hooks, the trout hooks that they have, you might have. I hope everybody can see that. Um, the small kind of golden ones are uh, for salmon eggs, and the larger ones are for uh, bait fishing or worms or something like that. Um, it comes with sinkers in here. There's, uh, oops, I can't find that. You kind of have split shot sinkers. I hope you all can see that. The split shot are these kind of round beady like uh, sinkers, and they're very easy to put on the line. You just kind of, they have a slip in them, and you just put a pair of pliers and uh, crunch them down. Um, when I was a kid, I used to use my teeth. They also come with a kind of bullet and a barrel weight too, which actually line goes through that. So you could have maybe set up some uh, swivels or um, something to kind of have this, uh, where the line can move through the weight. 
Um, they also have some treble hooks um, in there that you can, uh, sorry, I could get my camera up there. You can use for, I don't know, putting it back on your lure or uh, setting up for various fishing baits on there, with something like that. Let's see what else. Um, the red tool in the center is a, um, like a hook extractor. So that if the, if the fish swallows a hook deep in its throat, you can reach this in and kind of pull out the hook. Um, literally, if I'm gonna release them and fish, uh, swallow them too deep, I just cut the line too, as long as it's not a lure. Um, and then the hook will generally just uh, dissolve into the fish, the fish will dissolve it. You can also, if you want a, a blue thing in there, the string, if you are want to harvest your fish, and you don't want, you know, you catch a fish, and you want to keep fishing, you put them on a stringer, and you just string the fish up through the mouth and the gill plate, and let them sit in the water so they stay fresher and whatnot. Um, you can also, there's also uh, line clippers. I used to use my teeth, but my mom would hate that. Um, but that's just going to clip the line when you tie off the lures and whatnot. Um, here, here, they have the, the swivels and and barrel swivels and barrel uh, and snap swivels. Um, that there, if you want to like, you can hook on, tie the snap swivels onto your line at the very bottom. And then you can just snap on a lure very quickly and you don't have to keep tying it on. Uh, the, barrel, the barrel swivels are kind of where you can have a, tie a line onto the swivel, have another line come off to the bottom with a weight and then have a one line coming off with the, uh, bait you're using. Um, they also come with a bobber. That's the red and white thing up in the right left or uh, right top. Um, you just hook this onto your line and you have your line come to the top of it and line coming off the bottom and you have your hook down here. This is just uh, floating on the surface and when a fish strikes, you, it'll go down into the water and that's when you set your hook. And setting the hook is basically when that hook goes, when the bobber goes down, you just pull back on your rod. Maybe you're maybe you're drifting it down at nine o'clock, and when the bobber goes down, you come up to ten or twelve o'clock, and try to set the hook because when you're trying to fight the fish, you want to keep that line real taut and try to uh, as you reel it in. You don't want to kind of loosen up. That's where you kind of lose your fish. Um, it also has some jigs. Um, you know, you can use these for trout, but these will actually even work out in the American River there for, uh, it's here in Sacramento for shad. Uh, that's a jig and you just kind of bounce that up and down in the water um, and um, to try to attract fish. Um, so after you get that tackle box there, uh, what do you use to actually catch the fish? Um, on the right is our salmon eggs. Um, you know, they come in a little jar like that. There, there they are and you just kind of grab them out and put them on the salmon egg hook. I don't know if you can see that. There, that kind of, and you just kind of put that on that little golden hook. Um, they fit right on there. Um, how I usually have it rigged up is um, that split shot. It's um, kind of um, kind of below the lid. You just, with a pair of pliers, you put the line through the gap there, the, the notch, and just crunch down on them. So you have that the split shot maybe a foot up from your hook and then the, uh, the uh, salmon egg is on the hook and you just flick it out there and let it bounce along the bottom. Probably salmon eggs would probably be mainly used in the stream environment, um, mostly, or that's where I've used them anyway, but you might could use them in a lake, but mainly in the stream. Um, and then on the left, that's a dough bait. Um, that you kind of, I don't know if you can see, but you just kind of jar in there and you just, you kind of have your, um, you kind of reach in there and kind of ball up the, pull it out, kind of roll up into a ball, and then you put put it on the hook. Um, um, and then how I'd have it set up is I'd have the line coming into the bobber on the top. So you kind of, your top of your line here, and then the bottom of your line coming out, you put a line maybe a foot or so, or whatever you want, and uh, however depth of the stream or lake you're fishing in, then tie on the hook and then put your, um, uh, power bait or your uh, dough bait onto that, and it just kind of has it floating in the water. You're kind of watching that, and when the fish grabs it, you can pull it down, and that's where you kind of like, set the hook again. You know, and like I say just that's where you just pull back on the hook, 
black on the line and uh, hopefully it'll uh, get to set the hook inside the fish's mouth and hope you can fight it and bring it in. Um, these next lures are uh, lures fishing. Um, the lures on the left are spinners. Um, they are I, they are pretty versatile too. You can use them in a in a, a lake environment, a stream environment. Um, they're pretty. Some of them are pretty simple. I mean, that's probably the simplest one I had right there, just with a treble hook and a blade. Like I say, all of the spinners have in common is the blade. This this part of it here, the blade part. And so you tie that onto your line, and that that blade will spin in the water, causing uh, probably vibrations in the water that'll attract the fish. Some of them are silvery, so that they, some of them are silvery of uh, blades, will maybe put a flash in the water so it'll attract them. Um, and they also have uh, hairy, fuzzy things on the back, so they can be kind of high fluting uh, lures. And like I say, these are pretty versatile. You can use them in both streams and in lakes. They work equally well in both. The other type lure on the right, are spoon lures. Um, I personally use them mainly in lakes. Um, you can probably use them in streams. Um, they uh, they kind of, you tie them on. One thing I like about spoons is you can cast them a little bit farther. So if you're out in the lake, they can, you know, they can, maybe have a little bit more weight and air resistance and you can get them out a little bit farther. This is an example of one, it says, you know, uh, patterns on it. Um, now you have this type too, uh, 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 spoon type lure. Um, like I said, I use these mainly in lakes. They cast out very far. I think what they really do is kind of, uh, kind of between the body and the middle of the hook, or then the middle of the body of the fish, this part and the hook, it kind of makes a wobble in the water. So the, the, the hook is kind of moving, you know, back and forth as the body of that kind of going through there. So it may look like a fish of some kind, and then they're usually silvery or gold or some way that make a, make a flash that actually will attract uh, fish um, to it. Um, and like I say, they work great in this lake environment. Um, if you may be a little more, done a little bit of fishing um, and you're kind of interested in maybe up in the game a little bit or trying something different, um, you may think about fly fishing. Um, uh, first of all, on this uh, stream, or if, if you're trying to stream, even if you're trying to fish for the stream, but they losing any kind of lures or whatnot, um, kind of try to read the stream. The fish would be hanging out kind of, you're kind of looking to put your lure or bait kind of up in the, I don't know if you can see it, but the, up in the kind of where those big plants are, those big green plants that are kind of uh, onto the center left. Um, sometimes there'll be an undercut bank in that area. The fish will be hiding under there. Um, you're kind of looking for areas in the stream where the fish can have a slow area to move or to hold and the, the, the food can drift by them and then they just go out in the current and get the, uh, the, the food item they're looking for. So I mean, he's the, the, fish, the guy fishing there is kind of really close to that rock, but I would put whatever might bait I'm using real close to the rock there and let it drift around behind there because the, the rock right directly behind the rock is a place where the fish can hold and the current goes around on either side of it. And the fish, if there's a fish there, it can kind of get up and um, um, uh, grab the food item that you're presenting. Um, even if you look farther up in the stream, almost to the middle back of the stream, it kind of looks like a flat spot. It kind of looks like a flat spot with some white riffles coming down from it. You can maybe fish the bottom of that riffle area and there's probably fish in that kind of area. Um, most people are maybe kind of intimidated by fly fishing. Um, you know, you hear about back casts and things like that. You can see that he's uh, he's out in the open and just waiting in the stream. Um, I'm not sure the time of year, but when I wade streams, I just actually uh, have some wading shoes and just in my shorts. And you don't really have to worry about the back cast because it's all open there and you can kind of get your full cast Kind of the goal would be to have the rod go from 12 to 10, um, 12 to 10, and then, you know, to kind of lick it out there. But the beauty of fishing these streams are you don't really have to cast very far. You just kind of need to get it out there. And the reason for that is, is the, the, uh, a lot of the water is kind of hiding anything that's kind of going on because of the turbulence of the water. 
Um, and, and so, like I say, I wouldn't be kind of too intimidated by it. I all self-taught with fly fishing um, and just kind of learned myself. Um, anyway, maybe the next slide, Leslie. And yeah, so um, this is a kind of the basics of what you need. On the right is a, a fly rod with the case um, and the reel. You kind of want to get the case just because fly rods are kind of expensive and you want to kind of protect it from being broken. Um, that fly weight on that fly rod is a three weight. So it's sort of a small rod. Um, the weights go from, I don't know, maybe even zero these days, zero, one, two, three, four, five, whatever. And so the uh, higher the number of the weight, the larger the, the uh, uh, rod is and uh, maybe handle, be able to cast farther um, and handle bigger fish. Um, that's kind of a moderately priced uh, Rod. Again, if I was going to go and for my first time fly fishing, I would buy a combo set that would come with the rod, the reel, the line, and the uh, um, um, uh, case there. Now, the line yard is, is a little bit different spinning stuff. One of the lines you got to get off for a fly rod is backing line. I don't have a picture of it here, but that's kind of a line that goes uh, that this green line will hook into. Um, the, the green line, I don't know if you can see that. Wait, 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 wait. That's kind of the, the fly line, which hooks into the backing line. Um, I wouldn't get really too worried about all this. You just tell the wherever you buy it, a fly shop would be the best. And they can, they'll just put it on your reel for you. So you can already ha have, uh, have that. Um, um, they, they'll have put it on there for you. Um, so that's, that's the fly that kind of goes to the backing and the fly line. The, 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 the one that kind of goes to the backing line is this blunt end. Um, that kind of goes to the fly line, they tie that off onto it, and then they'll reel that out there. And then uh, on the tip of this fly line, you'll put the lever on, on the, on the uh, uh, tip of the fly line. When I first started fly fishing, you can kind of see that loop. <laughs> uh, they didn't have these loops. You just had to tie all this stuff together using various knots, which I was never very good at, but I just would tie them to make sure they got on. And I even kind of resisted using these loops, um, but after a while, I saw how simple it was. All you could do is you know, put the uh, run this through the loop of your on your fly line, just run it through the loop, and I'm not, I'm not sure, but you kind of pull it tight. Very easy, so you don't really have to know any any kind of knots um, to tie the the fly the leader onto the fly line, um, and it makes it pretty strong, you know, connection there. You don't have to worry about it breaking maybe. Again, I would. Uh, go, if I was purchasing this for the first time, I would look for a combo set. They might would be in a four or five weight, which be uh, a very good overall rod for a lot of different fishing experiences you can use. Um, next slide, maybe, Leslie. So there's your kind of the tackle box, um, you know, uh, uh, for it. It's just kind of a pouch that goes around my neck. And I kind of, I'm kind of a minimalist fishing person. I don't like carrying a lot of with me. Uh, mainly, I fish the canyons of the American River, Rubicon, kind of the Sacramento area. But anyway, you have on the um, on the right there is a, a fly box with the leader on it. So you know, you carry these around with all my flies. I only carry about one in there. Um, I don't have a lot uh, a lot of the tools that are on the right side. But you have kind of on as you're going from the uh, right to the left, you have some needle nose pliers or some forceps. Both of them are there. They're good for um, getting hooks, stretching the hooks out of the fish's mouth, um, that kind of thing. Maybe uh, the, the, the little jar there, that's, uh, that's called float. And so if you're dry fly fishing, you, you kind of put that on the fly and it'll keep the fly at the surface. Um, the circular black uh, things are called tippets. And what I do is I put a fly on the leader, maybe start out with a fly on the leader, and then if I, if I break it off or try for something else, you'll kind of kip, flip up and take uh, out or you'll kind of make that shorter. But at some point I'll tie that tippet on using a blood knot, which I wish I could describe it to you, but um, uh, to, how to tie it, but maybe we show it somewhere. But that kind of makes a strong knot and then, you, then you're just kind of clipping on that. You're not clipping off your line, off your leader. Um, then I have a pair of scissors. They're kind of in the center of that. That's what I use to snip the excess line that I use um, when I'm tying stuff off. Um, 
And then in the pouch kind of below the scissors, you can also put a various flies in there too. So on my tackle box, I, or my fly boxes, um, oh, look at this. Yeah, they got the various um, types of flies. There's dry flies, nymphs, and streamers, your basic kind. Um, uh, here's a, here's a, actually, this, that's almost the same fly I got. That's a streamer called a woolly bugger. Um, and you see all the, the feathers behind it. It kind of gets in the water and just kind of uh, moves around and uh, wobbles to kind of attract the fish. The nymphs are, um, you kind of fish with those subsurface. And um, a lot of times I'll use uh, indicators. I don't, I don't have them, but those are kind of indicators. There's even directions on how to put them on on the back. So you don't really have to know too much before going in because I'll explain it to you all. It, it, they'll, all, they'll all explain it to you. This is another type of indicator. And again, it'll explain how you put it on the back, uh, how explain how do you put them on. But anyway, you'll, you'll put your indicator on the line and maybe a foot below that, you'll put your nymph on there um, and it'll just kind of float. And when the indicator goes down, that probably means you got a fish on there. That's when you want to kind of set the hook again. Again, you want to pull your rod back up to 12 o'clock, get it high, the tip high in the air to try to uh, set that hook in the fish's mouth. Um, I got, let's see, let's see if I grab um, I have, Here's a Copper John. I don't know if you can see it, Copper John nymph. Um, and so but there, there are all sorts of varieties, um, both the ones uh, on the picture and the ones in my hand. They have the bead head, which is this thing right there, which actually gives it some weight to get it down more close to the bottom of the water. And then uh, about, towards the bottom of the, uh, the river. And then my favorite are dry flies. I think that's uh, elk calcatus. Um, to me, the dry fly is probably the easiest to use. Um, you put the float, you, you tie that onto your line and put the float on the fly. Um, and it floats on the surface. You get it out there, it drifts down. Um, when the fish strikes, you'll see it. And then you kind of set your hook again. Um, I think the, the, the bomb for any, Fly fishing box is the yellow humpy. That's an elk caddis. They work too. You can kind of see it's maybe a bee pattern. Let's see if I can. It's got the yellow body on it. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. There's a yellow body on it. Um, that's the uh, yellow humpy, and that's what I that's what I basically learned on. Caught a lot of fish on that fly, and, and a lot of different waters. Uh, um, like I said, very easy to use. Um, maybe next slide. There is my box again. Um, generally, I just kind of have a mix and match of what I'm putting in uh, in the various slots of my box there. That, I think that might even be the same box and that goes in the center of my pouch. Um, you know, um, I don't tie them, so maybe a little expensive and stuff, but, and, but I'm always going through them. I have a small fortune of flies in the trees, all the rivers. Um, uh, but a lot of times I just kind of fish. I'm, get, I'm getting where I can't see. So I just try to put one fly on and just work with that. The fish will chew them up a little bit and you have to kind of, uh, 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 you know, change them out just because if you catch a few fish on them, they tend to uh, chew them up. I would say, if, you know, you're getting into wanting to expand your horizons on it and learn how to tie flies. That's a real advantage because you can, you, a lot, lot more diversity of flies you can tie. Again, the Flies on the on the top of the uh, uh, fly box there are those are the nymphs, and on the left on the right hand side and on the left hand side those are the dry flies and my box always has the yellow humpy which you can't kind of see uh, from the middle there. Anyway, maybe next slide. I'm going to get the slide uh, showing a, a roll cast. Um, usually, like I said, when that, when that, you saw that person fishing in the stream, he's probably doing a lot of back cast, ten to twelve, ten to twelve. Say you're in a water where it's confined by alders or willows or something, you may have to go to a roll cast. And as you can kind of see, that kind of gives you an idea what you do. It's you kind of get it out on the water and just kind of bring your rod back and flip it back out. Just kind of flip it back out. So you don't have to have the back cast uh, and uh, 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 you know lose a lot of flies into the trees, which I have done quite a lot. Um, anyway, maybe next slide. And I think that is Leslie. Uh, so hello, everybody. Um, so for our trout species in California, we have four main 
types of trout, um, two native species and two non-native species. So for our native species, we have cutthroat and rainbow trout. And then our non-natives are our brook trout and our brown trout. So we have three subspecies of cutthroat trout and then eight subspecies of rainbow trout. Um, all of these trout are eligible for our heritage trout challenge, uh, except for the Paiute cutthroat trout um, due to conservation efforts that are going on right now, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But um, we don't have time to go over all 11 of these species. So that was why we did the poll. And it seemed like, okay, the number one was the California golden trout. So we'll go ahead and go over that one. And then following that was the coastal rainbow trout. Um, so before we move on to those, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the Paiute cutthroat and why it's not um, open to fishing right now. Um, so as I guess, let me back up a little bit. First as part of the heritage trout challenge. What, what that basically is, is um, you can fish and get six different kinds of trout out of those 11 species. Um, you document your, your catch with a photo and then you label that with the, the name of the trout and uh, where you caught it. And then you fill out the Heritage Trout uh, Challenge application and you submit that to this address uh, on the screen there. Um, this ang the Angler's Guide to the California Trout Challenge is a really cool, um, book that was made to kind of help angler to help guide anglers through the challenge it gives you tips on where where you can fish and kind of some gear types to use um, and it includes all the species that are eligible uh, and that can be found on our website in pdf format and that's available to anybody uh, if you do complete the challenge you do get a full color 16 by 20 matted frame certificate uh, it has illustrations of the six trout that you caught um, by Joe Tomilleri, who's a renowned fish illustrator. Um, and you do also get one of these uh, um, heritage trout hats. Um, so if that, it's kind of, it's kind of something, just uh, a little boost to get you learning about the different uh, trout species that we have in California and all of the different opportunities, including, and including learning more about the conservation of the fish as well. So that brings me into the Paiute cutthroat trout. So this is a, a pretty rare trout. It's actually regarded as the rarest trout in North America. Um, it lacks all body, it lacks body spots. Every now and then you'll find a couple at the base of the, the caudal peduncle or the caudal fin here. You can see a couple on the end of this one. But they have a really like pink purple iridescent color to them. Um, and of course the characteristic cutthroat slash. Uh, they're native to only 11 miles in Silver King Creek and some small tributaries in Silver King Creek. And so currently they are close to angling for restoration purposes. So right now we have a multi-agency effort underway to restore them um, back to their native range. So they were essentially um, extirpated from their native range due to hybridization and um, environmental impacts, and things like that. So between the years of 2013 and 2015, um, we removed all the non-native fish from the area, the native range, uh, which is in Silver King Creek below Llewellyn Falls and then downstream to a barrier near Snodgrass. Um, from 2016 to 2018, we did monitoring to make sure that uh, the, the removal was effective and that there were no fish left in the section before um, reintroducing um, fish from refuge populations back into the area. And so in 2019 and 2020, we had our first two years of translocations um, and they were very successful in moving um, 30 fish in 2019 and 44 fish in 2020 uh, into the native range. So we're working on building that population. Uh, and the goal is to, sec to successfully restore the population and one day um, allow angling for the opportunity for anglers to be able to fish for one of the rarest trout in North America. But we do have to make sure that that population is healthy and able to sustain fishing pressure. 
So moving on to the one you guys chose, um, coastal, coastal cutthroat wasn't one of them. So I'm gonna just skip through these slides until I get to, um, okay, coastal rainbow was the second choice, but being that it's first in my slides, I'm gonna go ahead and talk to you guys about this one first. So um, coastal rainbow are widely distributed throughout California. This is gonna be one of the fish that there, there's the most uh, opportunity to fish for just because of this, the distribution. Uh, they're highly variable in color and body shape. Um, and they, there are two forms. There's the resident stream form and the anadromous form, which um, are known as steelhead. So these, the, the resident form are heavily spotted with small black spots all over the body. Um, they're an iridescent blue to like a nearly brown with really silvery sides. Um, and they'll have the, the pink or red uh, along the lateral band. Um, it's, it's kind of spread out, not really super um, distinct like a line, but you, you can definitely tell it's in, in the center of the fish, which is what the lateral band is. Um, the juveniles will have large oval par marks um, and the, the, when they grow into adulthood, those will go away. Um, steelhead are gonna be a lot larger in size and they're gonna be a more silvery blue chrome color. Um, and they'll have a more squared off tail. And I do have a picture of the a steelhead on the next. So um, here's a picture of a more steelhead looking rainbow trout there. Um, so some tips for fishing for coastal rainbow trout. Um, they'll take almost all forms of tackle and bait. So you, you really have a lot of options for fishing for them. Fly fishing and spinner rods work really well. But uh, due to the variety of habitat that they occupy, it's hard to provide like really specific recommendations. And the best thing we can really recommend is that you check with local fishing shops um, or uh, local guides or things like that, people like that that have more, um, more specific information on the area where you're, where you're specifically fishing. And the second species you guys chose is the California gold trout. Um, this, is, this is actually the state freshwater fish of California, and it is widely regarded as one of the most beautiful trout in the world. Um, you can see that by its appearance. It's got spectacular bright coloration. Um, it has that deep green olive that fades into that really bright gold color on the side. And then it has that nice red, orange, like really vivid color in the lateral band and the opercular, which is the cheekbone and then on the belly there. Um, and then it has these, these uh, leading white edges on the paired fins that um, are really distinct and stand out a lot as well. So these fish are native to two stream systems on the Eastern side of the Kern River and that's the Golden Trout Creek and the South Fork Kern River. Um, we do stock them outside of their native range in high elevation lakes and streams throughout the Sierra Nevada um, mountains to provide more fishing opportunity for them, but those fish would be out of um, their native range and would not qualify for the Heritage Trout Challenge. So some uh, fishing tips for, for California golden trout. Um, all the waters in the Kern Plateau are open to angling, but a lot of them are only accessible by trail and are largely encompassed within the Golden State Wilderness. Um, there are some, out, some areas south uh, um, or some areas of the South Fork Kern that are adjacent to forest roads um, that provide easier access for fishing, but these lower portions of the watershed near Kennedy, Troy, and Menachi Meadows, um, you're, you're more likely to find hybridized fish there as well. Um, so catching a, a true California golden trout will be a little more difficult. Um, their golden trout are readily known to take all types of flies. Um, you can do particularly well if you 
do dry flies or uh, terrestrial patterns. Um, and you can also try small lures and casting. Um, but in small tributaries, that when there's a lot of vegetation lining the tributary, that, that can sometimes be difficult and you can lose some lures in there. So this is, a, this is actually a, a golden trout that John caught. Yeah, that's, a, that's the one I got. I got it in a Golden Trout Creek. Actually, <laughs> the Golden Trout was probably the one that the, actually the true challenge came in because we hiked into the Golden Trout Wilderness for about nine days, uh, hiked over the uh, Little Kern, into the Kern, caught by Kern River Rainbow in the Kern, then uh, hiked up to Golden Trout Creek. And that's like, that's why I caught that fish in Golden Trout Creek in Little Whitney uh, Valley. The one thing I'll say, if you could ever get the opportunity to try to go into the Golden Trout Wilderness, you catch a beautiful fish in a beautiful uh, setting. Um, they're not very big, but that, the real trophy is the, the beautiful fish that you catch there. They're colorful like that. And we hiked over to the South Fork Kern, and I got my uh, little Kern, or uh, the uh, Golden Trout, uh, California Golden Trout over there. And then we finished up by going to the Little Kern, and I uh, got my uh, little Kern Golden Trout um, when we went over there. Uh, like I say, it was a big challenge uh, hiking. My brother tried to kill me, maybe, um, but we did it. Um, and like Leslie said, you don't really have to make it that big of a challenge. You can probably, there's probably roadside areas where you can call with the Fresno office and they will probably maybe guide you to where you could go where you don't have to fish for them um, in such a, a strenuous manner as I did. In addition to our native fish, uh, we have our two non-native fish that the department manages for as well. Um, and the first one's brook trout. Um, you can tell these fish from any other trout in California by the, it's like a wavy maze-like pattern on the back. Um, it's called vermiculation, but this is the only trout in California that has that. So that's a really good identifier. It, it's, you can see that it's like an olive green a brownish color and it often has some like reddish hues in there. Another really good identifying marker for this one is the red spots surrounded by blue halos. This is going to be the only trout in California that has that as well. Um, and then they have some very distinct pectoral, pelvic, and anal fins with those white leading edges followed by that black line. Um, and then these these fish are actually native to northeastern U.S. and eastern Canada. Um, they were brought into California in 1871. Uh, they're now present in many high mountain lakes and streams from the San Bernardino Mountains north to the Oregon border, uh, but they're mostly, a, they're mostly abundant in high elevation waters on the Sierra Nevada mountains. Uh, so fishing tips for brook trout. You want to use small lures, a uh, wide variety of flies and bait. They're very opportunistic feeders, so uh, there's a lot of different options there. Um, these are kind of similar to our coastal rainbow trout. Due to the variety of habitat that they, they're in, it's hard to provide specific recommendations for tackle, but if you check with local tackle shops or guides, um, they can give you a lot of insight on a particular area. And then our other non-native species is our brown trout. Um, this one's also pretty easy to identify. Um, it has no, red and uh, black. Uh, oh. It has a red and black spots. Um, typically, there there's like a pale a pale colored halo around those spots, and that makes it pretty easy to identify. You get that really dark olive brown color throughout the fish, fading into like a yellow. Um, these, these are, these can be really big fish. They have the maxillary extending beyond the eye, which is the jawbone there. Um, they're native to Europe, North Africa, and Western Asia, and were brought into California in 1893. Um, they're now present in, uh, suitable waters in the interior of the state, especially on both sides of the Sierra Nevada mountains. Um, and I say suitable waters because they are limited by temperature. So brown trout prefer temps between 53 and 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, that does limit their range. 
so some fishing tips for brown trout. Um, small high elevation streams will offer some fast action fishing, meaning you're going to be able to catch a lot of smaller fish quick, quickly. Um, or some mixed species fisheries. So if you're interested in getting like more than one species. Um, and then large rivers and reservoirs with natural spawning populations um, and tributary streams can offer some trophy size brown trout like you see in these pictures here. Um, they are known to be wary, so tar targeting these larger fish is a challenge, uh, but it is rewarding to catch a really big brown. Um, again, they occupy a variety of habitat, so talking to your local tackle shops um, or guides is, is helpful when um, trying to target in gear for a specific area. There's a wild non-native brown that John caught. Yeah, that's on, I think, the East Walker River. Um, and I, I think I was actually dry fly fishing, catching that so that, you know, they'll come to a variety of flies too. Uh, like, like Leslie was saying, they're traditionally considered kind of wily and uh, uh, hard to catch. But, you know, uh, the smaller ones are maybe much more, uh, have a much more broad feeding pattern. So they'll go after dry flies, which is what I cut that on, nymphs and all that kind of stuff. Um, probably caught it out there in the pool. It's kind of back on the other side over my shoulder, um, looking back in there. Um, but yeah, that's a, a brown that I caught on the East Walker. Right. So um, we have some different management strategies for fish for our trout fisheries in uh, California. So we have both stocked and wild trout. Um, our stocked fish, we have different sizes, fingerlings, subcatchables, catchables, trophy, and our brood stock fish. Um, and then our wild fish, we have wild native and non-native populations. Um, so the, the big difference here between like a wild and a native fish is that uh, a native fish is a fish that naturally existed in the area without any human intervention, while a wild fish um, is just a fish that was born in the natural environment and is part of a naturally reproducing self-sustaining population. Uh, so like, for example, that fish at the top is the coastal rainbow. And we have, we have both native populations of those fish and wild populations of those fish um, where they're, uh, they've been established outside of their native range. Um, and then the California golden trout there in the middle that's um, native that we talked about earlier. So uh, that's a good example of just a native fish. And then you can also have self-sustaining populations of non-native fish, which would technically also qualify as a wild fish. And we do have some brook trout fisheries like that where they are self-sustaining populations. So the, the fingerlings that we have in the hatcheries are fish that are less than five inches in length. Um, these are mostly planted in high mountain lakes. Uh, they're small enough that we can get them up there. They're mostly um, planted by airplane or by horse and mule. Um, these are in, like I said, high mountain lakes. So these are pretty remote locations. These are all gonna be places that you're most likely going to have to hike into. And then um, we have subcatchable to trophy sized trout that also come out of our hatcheries. Um, our subcatchables are about seven inches. Our catchables are around 12 inches. And then we have a super catchable at um, 19 inches and then trophy trout at greater than 19 inches. So this top picture, uh, is a, one of our Lahontan cutthroat brood stock from Heenan Lake. Um, and this, you can just see like this old hatchery truck here. The, I think this picture's from the 60s and just some of the larger fish coming out of the, um, the tank there uh, being planted. So um, this is just to provide different kind of fishing opportunities for our anglers. Um, and then here's an example of a catchable rainbow trout that John caught. Yeah, I, we, I was actually going for those trophy LCTs, the Lahan cutthroat trout that you saw in the slide before. 
Um, this is an Indian Creek Reservoir. It's a, it's just a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> you know, uh, out to pursue those uh, broodstock or large uh, Lahontans. But I, I don't catch big fish. I catch small fish like that, or the smaller fish. And that's a hatchery rainbow that's also in the lake. Um, some of the hatchery rainbows you can tell from a wild fish that they'll have a lot of fin erosion. As you can see on the like the back fin there and uh, the the tail fin. Um, sometimes even the belly fins are uh, will get erosion, and that's how you tell. But they're still fun to catch. Um, and I so I didn't get skunked that day, even though I probably didn't catch my big fish. I, well, actually I did, but <laughs> uh, I didn't have a picture of it. But anyway, it was a great day. That's real recent. All right, so um, we are we have thirteen trout hatcheries uh, currently active. Um, they they um, they are old as our Mount Shasta hatchery is our oldest is being established in eighteen seventy seven, um, and our newest hatchery, the American River hatchery, was established in nineteen sixty eight. But the, this is basically just to kind of give you guys an idea of that we have these hatcheries that produce either one or more trout for angling opportunities throughout the state. Um, and as you can see here, I mean, we have hatcheries throughout all six regions. Um, so that's all working toward providing angling opportunities. Um, and that's the end of the slides for us. Uh, I don't know how much time we have left. If we have extra time, I could go back over some of the uh, native trout. Um, Tish, if you just want to let me know. Actually, we've been getting a lot of questions in, so I think we'll devote a little bit of time to those um, and then see where we're at. We we're a little bit, we're cutting it close to one o'clock, but let's try to get to some of these questions. Uh, first, John, would you use a weight with the spoon type lures that you were talking about earlier in your presentation? A weight? Uh, I wouldn't because that's what I like about them. They're kind of heavy. Okay. And, so, and you can really cast them out far into the uh, lake. Um, and you just let them sink on their own. And when they hit the bottom, you just slow retrieve them in, uh, uh, just very slowly reel them in. They'll be wobbling. And when you hear, when you feel the something, grab it. Like I say, you just set the hook, pull back on the rod when you feel that. Sometimes it'll be the bottom, but you know, you don't want to miss a fish. Um, but no, I wouldn't put weight on them. They are, they have their weight in built into them almost. Okay. Um, and then you also were talking about a gill plate. What what is the gill plate? You said oh. you use it when stringing fish to keep. Oh, um, if you look, uh, I'm not sure it's on the screen. Well, well, this is a good okay. That fish. If you look at the map, yeah, is, is I can't I, I can see that. That's the gill plate. And so if you want to, can put you see the, my cursor? Huh? Can you see yes. my cursor? Yes. So this yeah. is the gill so, plate right here. Okay, so up towards the I guess face of the fish. It's yeah. like the cheek. It's like okay the cheek cover. Okay, perfect. So where should you keep your fish once you catch them? A cooler, a bag? Well, I, I, after, immediately, that's why I had the stringer. If you catch them immediately, I'd put them on that stringer, just leave them in the water to keep them. Okay. Um, okay. Then if you're your campground, I would just put them in an ice chest until you're ready to eat them, or even until you're ready to transport them home. You know, just put them on ice as much as best you can. Um, They'll probably last a little bit. Um, I don't really, I don't really harvest the fish I catch, um, but I'm sure that you could probably almost uh, backpack them and bring them all back a, on a day trip and still be in uh, eat a, edible fish. But for the most part, keep them in the water with that. Yeah, with the stringer okay. as you're fishing for them. Okay. Say you you're, you don't want to you catch a fish you don't want to quit. You, you use the stringer and then you just kind of set it at your feet and there's a this part will kind of maybe go through the mouth and through the gill, and then you just okay. hook it onto the, into the ground and at your feet. And then you just carry them around that way until you're done. And the water is usually fairly cool enough to keep them cool. And then okay. you can put them on ice if you're driving home or, you know, um, to stay them at your camp, eat them at your yeah. camp, or you put them on ice. The, okay. the, stringer, the stringer usually has like a, like a, hard end on it that you'll just feed like through the fish's mouth here and then it will come back out underneath the gill plate okay and then you're going to put that through the hoop and then that would hold 
the fish on. And then you just tie that off and leave them in the water because that's gonna keep them at the temperature they just came from. Okay, now since we're on this topic, we had another question just come in. What is the best practices for catch and release? Um, probably uh, pl don't play the fish a lot. Um, keep it in the water. Um, make sure you have a net and to keep it in the net as you're trying to get the hook out of it, out of its mouth. Um, I used to like, that's why I like the forceps and pliers because you can really release a hook very easily. If you, you know, like I say, keep it in the water. And if you wanna take a picture of it, just lift it barely out of the water. So that um, it's, even if you can keep the, gill, the water's gills going over the, through the mouth and out of the gills, um, so to get its oxygen. Um, because when you're, when you're, think about when you catch a fish, you've kind of exercised it. And if it would be you putting your head in water after you've been exercised, you don't have a lot of oxygen left. Um, and then when, uh, so you, like I say, try to keep them in the water, keep the gills covered. If you wanna take a picture of them, do it real fast, take a picture um, and then put them back in the water. Sometimes you might have to relieve, uh, 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 kind of revive them a little bit. I usually, if they're, as long as the gill plates are still moving, they're probably in good shape, but you might have to move them back and forth in the water to kind of get the water to go through their gills. And then they'll just swim off. And hopefully okay. that would have been a sex, successful catch and release. Yeah, and yeah. to add to that, they do, they do have some more fish-friendly nets these days that are made of like more of a rubber compound uh, that's less damaging to the fish. Do they bite <laughs> people? <laughs> they bite your lure. Uh, no, I've, never had, well, I've never had a fish bite. Okay. Not typically, but you can get their teeth scratch on you or something like that. Okay, someone was talking about the, some of the trout in the pictures today were little. <laughs> um, are they all that size? And do you eat the little ones? <laughs> so uh, it's gonna depend on if you're doing catch and release or harvesting. Uh, so if it's something you harvest, um, Typically the harvest is like 12 inches or more um, to harvest them. Um, some of these ones that are really little like the golden trout and some of those other ones, they are gonna only be little. 14 inches is gonna be a really big fish. Uh, and that's because they're just in really small habitats. So these okay. high mountain lakes and streams are not, are not big, huge open areas where like the Lahontans, this is the lake form. Um, and you see mm -hmm. how big this fish is here, right. but the stream form of this same fish is much, much smaller. Um, so it just depends on the habitat and the species. And talking about harvesting, um, someone asked, how do you get the bones out of a trout? Every time I eat them, they're full of bones and it's a lot of work for a little payout. Any tricks? Um, the bones are hard to get out. Uh, if you're really good with a fillet knife, you can do fillets. Uh, you do lose a little bit of the meat that way. Um, but yeah, I don't have any really good tricks to get the bones out. Uh -huh. you, you have any really good tricks to get the bones out, John? But I don't really have a lot. Of, I, I've never really felt that uh, trout are all that bony. There's a lot worse. Um, and like I said, I just kind of maybe use whatever, if you're out camping, your knife or a spoon or a fork, and maybe just kind of slip the mate off, uh, off the rib cage there. You can cook them a lot, maybe, and just dissolve them. But like I said, I've never really had a big problem with the, the bones. Okay. Um, so one more question. Um, this person, I haven't started fishing yet. I'm brand new. How much money should I have to set aside to get everything I need to start trout fishing at the lake by my house? Is there a beginner's package or something that I can look for or that I need to get started? I know, John, you kind of showed us your tackle box at the beginning, but I guess if you had to put a price on something, is there like a starter kit? Uh, well, I'd, cons what? Go ahead, I'd, John. Cons I'd consider that box I showed as a starter kit. And that was... Okay. Uh, uh, you know, 10 bucks, I think, at the uh, uh, um, uh, box stores. Um, you know, the, that's why I kind of recommended uh, going and looking for combos. And you can probably find that the, they'll sell you the reel, the line, and the rod all, all in one package. How much they really are, I don't really know. It's been a long time since I've tried to fish for it. You know, I think if you go to a big box store, you're not going to be too expensive. Um, and then, you know, you then you're probably your other 
bigger spins is going to be your lures or the bait you happen to use. Uh, but I haven't really priced them out that much. But. Okay. Yeah. So it depends too on if you want to get into fly fishing or a spinner reel. Um, both have combos, like John was saying. Um, an entry level fly fishing combo, like with, with like a five weight nine foot rod, is going to be like $150 to $200. Um, there are some that come with everything, including flies. Uh, mm -hmm. But it just, it, the one thing I would say is it, it partially comes down to two, like if you want to invest a little bit more into like, maybe you don't want that combo that has all the flies and everything too, because if you're going to be fishing like a specific water where there's things that work better than other waters, you might want to kind of tailor your gear to that. And I mean, flies can be anywhere from a couple of bucks to probably maybe like 10 bucks, would you say, John? Well, not for an individual. You're talking about three bucks or so for an individual fly. Yeah. Um, and they sell them in packages and things like that. You know, fly fishing is going to be a little more expensive. Well, maybe a lot more expensive. It's going to be more expensive. I wouldn't, that's why I said recommend the combo and you're still paying a couple hundred bucks. Um, but first, that's what I think really, if you, if you, you know, go for the spinning stuff because, um, that that you can you can fish a variety of ways. You can fish with lures. You can fish with baits. You can fish. You can even fish flies with that spinning rod. Okay. And so you kind of start with that, and you can get them pretty inexpensive. Um, uh, but I would go. That, I would recommend starting with the spinning rod, and then work your way up and see what you know what what you like, what you don't, what you want, to, where you want to go with the fishing. Okay, uh, where can we go to learn more about fishing? Are there any programs out there that we should be following? I know, obviously, CDFW and our website, perhaps Fishing in the City. Do you guys have any that you follow? I, I don't know. They're fishing in the City, I know they'll, they'll provide you with a rod. Um, and, you, and that might be even a good source to do it. You may not be doing trout fishing. Um, okay. But, um, but I think, you know, uh, when I learned, we didn't have YouTube and all that stuff, but I'm sure that they tell you how to fish on YouTube and that's all that kind of stuff on the internet. Um, uh, and, and I'm sure that, uh, uh, like the fly shops will probably maybe even have lessons that you can follow if you, if you Google the fly shops and stuff like that, like it, to learn how to do that. There's also things like, um, I don't know about right now with COVID, but like Bass Pro Shops, if you want to get into fly fishing, does some fly casting classes for free. Oh. Um, but I think, I don't think they're doing it right now because of COVID, but that is something that they normally do. And then like John said, a Trout Unlimited has some videos on their website about some fishing stuff. Um, and then, I mean, if you can just Google it and a ton of stuff will come up on YouTube of different, things for fishing too like John said with the internet these days like you can learn a lot just from that and it's easy to kind of see what's going on with the video okay yeah you know uh, I think I was lucky my dad showed me <laughs> uh does it make sense to try out fly fishing with a cheap regular rod uh, uh I actually think yeah that maybe try that or see what it see how it works on a spinning rod because that's going to be a lot cheaper way to go. And, okay. you know, it, it'll probably easier to cast too. Um, and you know, like I say, uh, and then you don't have to have the extra uh, uh, equipment, really. You just, you okay. just the same thing, but just apply on the end of the line. The only thing I would add to that is uh, if you did do that and you're trying to practice fly fishing with a spinning rod, you're not going to really get the whole idea of like, um, managing the line that you have out because okay. when you're fly fishing, you're not, you're not really using the reel to manage your line. You're going to be stripping your line in and letting your line drift out. And you're actually managing the line by hand. Um, and you don't use the reel until you're trying to reel up all your line. It's so it's, a, there is differences. So it's not going to be a straight comparison. Um, but it would give you an idea, like John was saying, if, if, you like the way that fish are responding to flies. Okay, um, 
we, we're getting so many questions. I know we're going over, but people are still really engaged with you guys. So I'm just going to keep going. Um, I try very hard to teach my grandson new things that I know nothing about. What do you recommend I focus on regarding teaching a five-year-old to fish? I tend to focus first on safety, respect, but I'd like to keep it simple and interesting for a little one. John, I know you've been <laughs> fishing for a while. <laughs> do you have any tips? I, I think I would kind of go to the fishing game and find out where they stock fish or how recently, and okay. then go to that spot. I think what kids are gonna really uh, like is if they, if they can get the, catch the fish and right. get one in hand. And so that if, if you go to our, if you can follow their stocking and go to their stock where they see them, you can see the fish swimming in the water generally, they're, they're below bridges and things. Uh, if you get to soon, enough, soon enough there, and then maybe they can actually have a better chance to actually catch a fish. Okay. Uh, and then I would work about work on the all the other things after that you get them kind of catching the fish. All right, we just popped our uh, fish stocking schedule into the chat. And speaking of stocked fish, are stocked trout safe to eat? What do you feed them at the hatchery? Mm, I, I think it, they're they, I, just trout chow. I'm not really exactly sure what they feed, what's in it and stuff, uh, but I'm sure it's safe to eat. Um, you know, it's like it's like eating uh, uh, any other raised uh, animal. Um, you know, what they feed them, so they are, they are safe to eat. Um, no problems that way. Okay, trout chow. I like that. Yeah, they're little pellets. You know, and actually, if you want to come over, you can see them in the hatchery. You can throw them in the water and let the see the fish come after them. Oh, which perfect. Is kind of, which, is kind of, which is kind of fun. Um, Okay, well, I think that we've got to a majority of the questions. If we didn't get to your question, again, just email us and we'll pop our email in the chat for you one last time. But we went a little bit over, it's 1.13. So our time together is up this Friday. Um, the email that you can email questions to if you still have some is r 3 statewide program at wildlife.ca.gov. Again, we'll pop that in the chat one last time. And please, you know, join us for our future R3H3 sessions, which include exciting discussions on an intro to archery and archery hunting. That's going to be on June 11th. And then on June 25th, we're going to have a great presentation on cannabis and CDFW's role in the cannabis program and how it falls in line with protecting our state's natural resources and native environments. You can find registration links by visiting the R3 calendar or by watching our social media or by signing up to receive monthly hunter angler updates through our online licensing portal. When you go to register for these R3H3 events, you'll also see our advanced hunter clinics. So um, take advantage of those as well. Lastly, a huge thank you to all of you, our attendees, for taking the steps to educate yourself on becoming the best hunters, anglers, and foragers you can be. Go out, have a great three-day weekend, and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you.